Uh, my name is Travis Vashon. Um, I work for starting a company called Distiller. I'm Travis on GitHub, and I'm T. Vashon on Twitter. Um, I am going to talk about ClojureScript today. Um, but first, I really need to apologize, because the title of my talk is totally meme and I know that's super lame. But there are no more memes in the entire presentation. I'm getting them all out of the way right here, and so you won't have to deal with that again. So you're welcome. Uh, second, a clarification. So I'm going to be using, I know the, the description of the talk referenced apps. And if somebody got the impression that I'm going to be talking about how to build an iOS app with Clojure today, um, I'm sorry, because we're definitely not going to do that, um, because that's frankly sort of insane in 2014. Um, maybe someday, but definitely not today. Um, I'm using app in the, the sense that Tim Bray is using it um, these days, which is to describe basically a collection of software that sort of forms a cohesive whole. Um, because that's what people are using that term to mean. And third, I'm going to do a demo at the beginning, um, the dangerous live internet beginning of the talk demo. So um, cross your fingers. So I am going to be demoing deploying ClojureScript to an environment called uh, Parse today. And uh, What's cool about that and what's cool about Clojure is that it makes it really easy to do demos like this. Um, if anybody has never used the line engine template stuff, um, that's what I'm doing up here, line new parse app demo. And that's literally something that you can do on your computer at home today. You can just type line new parse app demo and you'll have a parse app. Um, uh, and that's because line engine is pretty awesome. Um, I'm not doing too much else here. I'm copying some, some global configuration. Um, I'm copying a little bit of configuration so that you don't see the private things that I'm, I'm pushing up. Um, and then I'm actually doing some magic that I'll talk about a little bit later. Oh, shoot, right. I'm not connected to the internet. OK, well, then we'll, we'll um, wait on the demo until I am connected to the internet, which I guess is now. OK. Um, right. OK. So I, I've thrown out a bunch of terms here. So you guys probably have no idea what I'm talking about, which is totally fine, because uh, we'll, we'll figure it out by the end. Um, when I talk about parse, I'm talking about something that you can't see. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, a, a website called parse.com. So what happened with parse.com is that uh, uh, a guy tried to build a couple iOS apps, and he got really frustrated because it's, a, it's sort of a terrible environment. And so he built, um, rather than building these iOS apps that weren't really, really working, he built an infrastructure service um, to make it easier to build parse apps and, and uh, to build iOS apps. But what's cool about this is that it's actually good for building more than just iOS apps. Um, you can tell I'm just delaying. So well, let's go back into the, the thing here then. And we'll come back to the demo in just a second. So my company is building an iOS continuous integration deployment service. Um, we also want to make it easier to test ideas on, on iOS. We started out building iOS apps, um, but mobile is great, and mobile is horrible. Um, and we just had a lot of trouble coming up with something that would, would work really well and, and something that we could test quickly on um, uh, interested users. Um, Parse is a, is a cool uh, backend as a service, makes it easier to build iOS apps, and it has a hosted Node.js-like environment for deploying code to. Um, there are a lot of as-a-service things these days, and Cloud Code is closer to App Engine than, say, AWS or something like that. Um, the important thing is that it deploys, uh, you can deploy JavaScript to it. Um, and when you're building iOS apps, Objective-C is a necessary evil. You can't get away from that, but JavaScript, at least, no matter where you are, is not. The rest of this talk is a story of our experience with ClojureScript on Parse, but it's not really about Parse, um, because this isn't an advertisement for Parse, because we're not at the Facebook developer conference. Um, it's about ClojureScript on Node.js, even though Parse isn't, isn't really technically Node.js. Um, but even more than that, it's a story about JavaScript and the fact that anything we can do in JavaScript, uh, we can do in ClojureScript a little bit better. Um, and that's cool because JavaScript is everywhere. It's, it's just, it's all over the place. This is actually the second 
weird place we've deployed ClojureScript. The first was uh, on the left over here. Um, that's actually the, the iOS UI automation tools, and you can use that to actually control a live iPhone and run tests on it and verify things about the, the interface. Um, and ClojureScript runs there, too. And JavaScript, I'm not kidding, it runs everywhere. It's just in all of these crazy places. Um, and so the rest of uh, this talk is, is hopefully convincing you that you can run them wherever you want. So let's get back to our demo. So um, we, we created a new ClojureScript project uh, using a LineAgent template that made it a one-liner. Um, LineAgent actually goes out to the internet and finds the template that you name and, and pulls it down. So that's, that's all you got to do. Um, and then we deployed uh, our, our app to parse. Um, and you'll have to trust me here because this is what it was doing before I deployed this code. Uh, it was a page not found, and now uh, it displays a widget. And if we go into the data browser and we add a new widget, widget two, um, and we wait for the internet, it'll be over here, and that's pretty cool. And just to convince you that this isn't, you know, just like a, uh, an easy way to create uh, objects, um, you can do things like sending SMSs, SMSs really easily. So check this out. We bring in a little a couple name. Oh god. We bring in a couple namespaces and. We add a new endpoint here. And then we're going to deploy it. And we'll wait a little bit longer. Um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to that in a few minutes. How many people here uh, have used Node.js? Awesome. How many people used Express? Cool. So this is just Express. They, they have Express available. They have a number of other modules available. You can send email, you can send um, text, you can send all sorts of stuff um, really easily. OK. Uh, and we'll come back to that once it's deployed. OK, so the first thing that I'm going to talk about is, is just our story, what we did, um, and, and how we got to be able to run uh, uh, ClojureScript on their environment. Um, when we started developing iOS apps, we knew that we didn't want to uh, build everything ourselves. We knew that there were a lot of shared things that people had already built, um, and we had no interest in redoing all of that. Um, we found Parse, and we realized that uh, you could deploy JavaScript to it. And my first thought as a hardcore, old school Clojure guy is I really want to run Clojure and not JavaScript. Because if I have to write Objective-C in JavaScript all day, I'm going to go insane. Um, so, so how'd that work out? So this is a parse project. This is actually what a, a very simple JavaScript um, web app would look like, too. You have some configuration. Um, you have a JavaScript file, and you have um, some HTML. And this is what a ClojureScript project looks like. You have some config configuration. You have uh, some HTML. You have a project file. And then you have some ClojureScript source. And the project file is just a normal LineAgent project file with a, a ClojureScript build uh, stanza in here um, that's actually pretty straightforward. Um, how many people have actually built ClojureScript things, anything with ClojureScript? So that's good. So you guys probably get what this is doing. For those of you that don't, um, it's not really as scary as it looks. This just says we have one build. It's called server. And you can actually light a bunch of this stuff if you only have one build. Um, and the source for that build is at uh, source. source. Um, and then you pass some arguments to the compiler. You say, hey, compiler, take the result of compiling all that closure script and put it in cloud main. Um, use white space optimizations only. Um, pretty print. Um, target Node.js. And don't use a hash bang. Um, and actually, a, a number of these didn't really work when we started. Um, so did it work? Not really. I mean, it did. Um, we started out targeting the browser, um, which was what we had to do because targeting Node.js had some even worse incompatibilities for what we wanted to do. Um, but there were issues with uh, the detection of arrays. So in JavaScript, I mean, objects are sort of this, this Detecting the type of an object is a, is a tricky thing. 
Um, the, the runtime has some support for it sometimes. Um, if you're in Node.js, it has a, a handy function called isArray that you can use, but uh, that's not available in all the browsers. So uh, that was the first thing we ran into. Um, the problem was that, uh, well, and there were some philosophical concerns. Um, why are we targeting the browser? We should be targeting the environment that's closest to uh, the environment we're actually deploying to, which is Node. So um, we tried to target Node. Um, there were some even bigger issues there. Uh, the util module is not available in our, our environment, but ClojureScript assumed it is. Um, uh, and uh, there was a hash bang being written into our JavaScript file, and parse was just exploding. So those were some practical issues. Um, at this point, we, we almost gave up. We thought, you know, this just isn't working out of the box. Um, it's not great. But we dug a little bit deeper and tried to figure out how hard it would be to use a custom version of ClojureScript. And it turns out it's actually not hard at all. So um, we uh, patched target Node.js. Um, we added uh, a preamble, um, or sort of the beginnings of preamble. It's evolved into something a little bit different, but also good. Um, and better control, hash bang controls. We actually didn't add that. Um, and used a custom version of the ClojureScript compiler. And this is all that looks like. Um, because ClojureScript, like everything else, is a library, um, you can pretty easily change it by just changing the closure source paths in your, in your project. Um, and what you're thinking now is, well, that's kind of insane. If I want to swap out closure, all I have to do is actually change the dependency. Um, and the trick here is that uh, ClojureScript is built using line CLJS build, which has some, some hard-coded stuff. It has a hard-coded ClojureScript dependency, and the only way that you can use a custom version with it is to change the source path sub. But this is actually not that bad. You throw a sub-module in there, um, and you keep it updated, and, and, uh, and you go home. OK, so the next thing we wanted to use um, is Core.Async. Async. And this, is, um, this was actually part of the, the, the big reason we wanted to use ClojureScript. Um, anybody who's done JavaScript knows all about uh, uh, callback hell. Totally didn't put uh, an example of that up here, but I have one later. Um, and callback hell is a real place. It's somewhere that developers go, and, uh, and it's not nice. Um, and and core.async really does fix that. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time right this second on, on, on showing you the difference between the two, but I promise um, we'll, we'll go there later. Um, but this is core.async. Um, we really wanted to be able to do things like this. Take this very callbacky uh, find, like JavaScript find method that takes a, a hash of um, callbacks, wrap it in a channel, and, um, and, and return the channel and have that be the way that we do uh, asynchronous operations. And again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, oh, actually, I won't talk about it a little bit about this later. Um, this is worth studying and, and making sure you understand. So uh, what we're doing here is creating a channel that can hold one thing. We're doing one thing, expect to get one result, and then we are sticking that result on the channel and closing it. Um, this is actually a lot like a promise. Um, uh, this is the way that, that um, JavaScript promises work, right? Um, you, you do a thing, and you expect to get a result, and then you ask it sometime later for the result. Um, and which is cool. I mean, promises are. are, are uh, neat and interesting, but they're, that's all they do. This is all they do. And what's cool about core async is that it does a lot more. So did core async work? Nope, not at all. So um, uh, this is sort of esoteric, but uh, core async uses uh, set immediate and set timeout um, in its kind of core dispatching things. Um, the idea being that uh, I think there's an event loop, and it's, it's making sure that things are happening, but it doesn't want to block the rest of the, the thing. Weirdly enough, I was able to patch it initially with, uh, by setting set immediate to this, this, this fun function that just takes a function and calls it, um, which if, you, if you're familiar with the semantics of set immediate or set timeout is going to make you a little uncomfortable because um, those should not have to wait for the function to return to themselves return. Um, so it was a little weird, but it worked for a little while. Um, at some point, we, we realized that a function called next tick is available, um, and we've, we've submitted a patch to JIRA. Um, and until then, we're using a custom version of, of core.async. And again, I, I'm, I'm talking about all this stuff not because I think you're following particularly closely or find this particularly interesting, but because 
Um, this is the kind of, of work that you might need to do if you want to extend Clojure Script into a new environment. It is work, but it's, not, it's actually not that bad. It's not that hard, and it gives you a chance to muck around in the internals, which is fun. OK, so the last thing we really wanted was protocols, because protocols are, are awesome. They let you uh, do polymorphism in all sorts of places that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do polymorphism, um, and, uh, and they're really fun to use. Um, so did that work? Well, I mean, kind of. And the problem is that um, uh, protocols in, in ClojureScript work by looking at the, the, the prototype of the, the thing that they're trying to figure out an implementation for. Um, you know, you, you call a function and it looks at the thing and then it says, okay, I know how to call that function with this thing and it, and it does that. But not everything in JavaScript is what you think it is. Um, in particular, in, in Node, um, sometimes things are created by C++ and, and it's ju that's just as bad as you, you might think. Um, and uh, ClojureScript doesn't really behave particularly well in that situation. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's why. But <laughs> it's uh, sort of esoteric. So um, the good news is that we were able to work around a lot of this with something that I think is not terribly widely known. I didn't know about it until like last week, um, which is extend type default. Um, you can actually extend protocols to the default, which, which basically lets you um, sort of override even the most uh, generic existing implementations. This note is a really evil thing to do to say I encode closure. If you were working in the browser and you did this, you would probably make your uh, application incompatible with a wide range of different libraries because you're, you're changing basic behavior of the operating si or of, the, of the system. Um, but we felt like we could do it because we're the only people running in this environment and we really needed to do it for compatibility. And this is actually one of the most powerful tools we, we discovered for um, extending to a really bizarre environment like this. Um, so that's, that's neat. So all that said, it works. And uh, more importantly, it was possible. Um, we were able to use a custom version of Core Async without any trouble. We were able to use a custom version of ClojureScript without any trouble. Um, Submitting patches upstream is a slow process, but it's totally worth the, you know, getting into it and understanding how it works, um, and it's a good idea. Um, so if you are interested in extending a, a closure script to an environment that it doesn't currently support, um, I suggest you do that. And uh, you should email me or get in touch with me uh, if you have questions, because um, we might be able to avoid some stumbling blocks. Okay. So um, let's go back to our demo here. Note that uh, most of the time we've been waiting for this, it's, it's just deploying to uh, the environment. Most of the waiting time here is deploying to the environment. And this is actually a problem. Um, it takes a while, take 14 seconds to do a raw build of the closure script. This is super unusual. It's because we're, we've got some, a whole bunch of weird stuff in there. Um, uh, and it, it probably took a while on this Wi-Fi to deploy to parse. Um, you can't run parse apps locally, and that's just as bad as it sounds. Um, uh, so we do a lot of development in the cloud, the, uh, or, or connected to the internet, all of our de development connected to the internet. The good news is that we have a script called bin develop um, that uh, wraps a few auto deploying tools. It wraps the auto compile in ClojureScript. It wraps a, a parse tool that auto deploys code. And so basically, once this actually gets going, it takes about 30 to 40 seconds to get fired up. But once it's going, um, we get deploys to the production environment in about uh, uh, six seconds or so. OK, so we deployed that code that we added to send an SMS. And um, uh, we did something really, if you were paying attention, you noticed we did something really awful here, which is um, send an SMS in a get. So if, any, if the Google browser happens to stumble upon this, the spider happens to stumble upon this, um, my friend Jeff is going to get a lot of texts. Um, but so we'll reload it, and Jeff is sitting there, and, and at some point here, he's probably going to get a text. And Jeff got a text, so nice job, Jeff. Um, so, and so this is how hard it is to send a text in this environment. And that's really cool. It's, it's, um, it's neat. You can do this. You can send emails and, and all sorts of things um, with just a little bit of code. So, so what's that look like? Like, what, what does an application like this look like? I showed you a really trivial one here in the demo, but um, uh, that's obviously not representative of, of everything that it can do. 
So let's talk a little bit about building parsed apps. And again, when I say parse, think Node.js. Um, there are some, some special things that parse is giving us that I'll show you, but um, this is really more about uh, server-side development. So we have all the normal tools. We have namespaces, which um, uh, I'm sort of underselling by just throwing out here like this. But um, when you, if any, for anybody that's anybody that has gone back to a non-closure environment after programming in closure, um, probably understands what I mean when when I say this is awesome. Uh, having this nice support for referring in just the variables, uh, just the functions you need, um, and creating aliases for things that you want to use in a, in a little wider context. Um, is amazing. You can create these, these beautiful little readable DSLs in your code um, just with a good namespace. Um, uh, we've got protocols available. Um, so uh, a parse object is not a, a closure script object. It's a JavaScript object. object. But we can extend things like uh, iLookup to a parse object and, and then use um, uh, keyword lookup just like we're used to. We can use select keys just like we're used to. Once you implement a small number of protocols on a new, uh, on, on like a, an important object in your new system, you get all this closure stuff for magic. Um, uh, uh, and you know, the alternative is stuff like this, parse object dot get in JavaScript, and then select keys is a bunch of for loops, and it's sort of a nightmare. And we have macros, and macros are awesome. I'm going to show you a, a bunch of places where we're using macros, and it's, it's totally cool. Um, but uh, this is huge. We don't have this in, in um, kind of straight up JavaScript. There are some things like sweet that I think bring in some stuff like this, but, um, but uh, it's a joy to have. And you know, et cetera. There's a ton of stuff in Clojure that uh, you just don't get out of the box with, with JavaScript. Um, uh, underscore can bring some of that in. Um, and different libraries can bring some of that in, but uh, closure is seriously batteries included, and you start to feel it. So the domain-specific stuff in parse uh, is, is kind of nice, too. Um, just a few examples of uh, the closure that we write and the equivalent JavaScript. So um, when you want to start referring to a new data type, this is actually all you do. You say def parse type widget. Um, you can save that widget, even if you haven't done anything on the parse side, and it just shows up. Um, uh, and this is actually not that far off from the JavaScript, um, but it's, it's kind of nice stuff. Parse also gives you a way to do uh, lifecycle hooks. So you can do before save, after save, um, all the, the normal stuff that you want to do. Um, we have played around a little bit with using Prismatic Schema Library with this stuff, and it works really well. Um, I am not using a ton of it right now, but it's, it's totally possible, um, and that's really cool. Um, you can see that in this case, we are starting to get some really nicer, more succinct code. Um, uh, except, oh yeah, okay. And, and we actually were able to hide the fact that there's a function in there, which is also kind of nice. You can also do these uh, just DRPC calls, which uh, are a little horrible. I mean, you'd never use them on the web. But uh, if you're building an iOS app, this actually does come in handy because you don't actually care about all the, the intricacies of an HTTP request. Um, and this is what uh, a fairly non-trivial, um, this is from their, their documentation. Uh, this is what it looks like in, 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 uh, in parse. And this is what it looks like in ClojureScript. Now, that's not totally fair because we've done a much better job of factoring this into um, you know, a few different well-named functions. Um, so let's actually look at factoring it in JavaScript. It's, it's even more horrible. Um, <laughs> and, and so, I mean, the difference between these two is, is uh, personally, and this might just be because my brain is, is broken now, but I, I find that a lot more readable. Um, so that's cool. Right, OK, so um, something I have been holding out on you. Um, there's a weird thing in here. Who's used port at async? So, so see that uh, less than question mark? That's some weird stuff. Um, that's, not, that's not stock port at async, but it is doing the same basic thing. And um, to fully understand what's going on there, we need to go to, as always, David Nolan, um, who, who uh, posted uh, last August about asynchronous error handling. And he had this really cool idea that you could make 
uh, error handling in an asynchronous environment, this callback hell kind of thing, look a lot more like a, uh, uh, error handling in a, a synchronous environment and actually get like normal stack traces and all sorts of good stuff. Um, and it's really simple. It's, this, is, this is all it is. So, so here's the basic idea. We have coordinate async channels. And when you, you create the channel, and you expect to just put one thing on that channel, and whoever gets that channel back knows, because that's the, the contract of the function that it's calling, that that channel that it gets back will just put one thing on it and, and then be done. So in that world, if that thing that it gets back on the channel is an error, as defined by this throw error function, then it can just throw that error back up. Uh, as long as the entire stack plays by those rules, then you actually get stack traces all the way up in an asynchronous environment. Um, there's this simple macro um, with a question mark that just wraps the normal um, core.async wait function and, uh, and throws, it if, throws the result if it's an error. Um, and that's all it takes. Go catch does the, the stuff. It's just like the Go macro, except that um, it looks like it's actually swallowing the result of, uh, uh, it looks like it's swallowing the error, but what it's doing is uh, returning it as the, the um, result of the channel that is created by the Go block. So Go blocks create an implicit channel that behaves according to the rules I just described. It's really cool. So you can do things like this. Um, List accessible repos, uh, goes and finds uh, the first user. What is it doing? Find first. Oh, right, OK. So it creates the, the uh, uh, accessible repo query list, finds the first one, returns it. If find first throws an error, that'll bubble up. And then uh, it'll, it'll bubble up through this list accessible repos thing. Um, and uh, and, and so we can deal with it at the, the correct level of abstraction. So that's what's going on there. OK, so um, let's talk about the actual interesting stuff, the stuff that I'm actually doing on a data basis. This is what web stuff looks like. Um, it's an express app. Um, uh, it's a little janky compared to most Clojure right now. We could use some more macros in here to get rid of that function. Um, but it's not so bad. And it, it looks a lot nicer than the, the equivalent JavaScript. And the interesting thing about the web is that it, the internet is made of lots of different things. And a given website is made of a lot of different things. And coordinating getting all those things can be a huge pain. So let's, this is a, a function that tries to figure out which of the projects that somebody has added are, uh, has, has access to are watchable. Um, so it needs to, this reads pretty well. Um, we go and we try, we uh, create the accessible projects query, which is going to take a little while. We go and we find all the watchable queries. Uh, watched projects. And those go and they fire off at the same time. Um, and then we do this, uh, this accessible projects CH. The problem is that this accessible projects query actually needs to wait on the result of the, the first thing, the query query. Um, and, uh, and so we need to actually wait inside there. And then at the end of all that, once we've got the accessible projects and we've got the watch projects, we take the difference. So this looks pretty nice in, in ClojureScript. This is how it works in JavaScript. We've got uh, the same kind of thing where we're doing the query to find the query and then doing the project thing. And then uh, we're finding the projects. And then we have this crazy thing here, this diff function, which uh, uh, has to check if, the, if both of the results are available and then do that. And we have to call this at the end of each of the things. It's just a nightmare. Um, and so if, if there's nothing, if you get nothing else out of it, I, I hope this is something that you take to heart because coordination can be really bad and it's just trivial with, with, with ClojureScript. Async is still really hard. Um, uh, this is a broken piece of code because it's going to try to send the async text and then it's immediately going to return um, uh, the HTTP response and actually cancel that, that SMS thing which sucks. So we need to remember, you always have to wait on all your async stuff, and you'll, you, we get bit by this a fair amount. So I said full stack, and I meant it. Um, so we're using ClojureScript on the front end, too, and, and this is cool. Um, because on the back end, we do um, uh, PRSTR on basically whatever we get back from whatever data finding thing we've got. And because we've extended the right protocols, um, uh, it, it all just works. 
on the front end, we've got this API request thing that automatically just uses the, the Eden reader to read the string, and it, it goes up. Um, and so this all just works. It, it, it feels very uh, uh, fluid, seamless. And it's all because we can do this, this protocol extension stuff. Um, I'm going to, I'm running out of time here, so I'm, I'm going to skip over this stuff a little bit. But um, as a point of interest, we're using uh, Unfocus, which is, uh, if you haven't used it, Unfocus and Live, all of these um, uh, HTML oriented uh, view layers are really cool. They're awesome. Uh, it works great on our front end, doesn't work at all on our back end, um, which is, it is what it is for now. Um, it takes HTML like this, it gives you a way to, to turn it into a template, um, and it's pretty cool. We're also using Jekyll, which is a little strange, um, but uh, it, Jekyll serves as sort of a macro system for our templates. And this is nice because we want to be able to deploy uh, dynamic code and static code, sort of, or, or dynamic pages and static pages sort of right next to each other. Um, and what this lets us do is use the same uh, layouts the exact same layout files for static content, stuff that's actually generated into static files and pushed up to the server, and dynamic stuff, um, stuff that, that has to run through all the express routes. Um, and this is the first time I've actually been able to do this, um, and that's awesome. I've, I've wanted this for a long time. So that's cool. This is almost, I almost forgot to even put this in here, but this is actually huge. Um, the dream of being able to share code between the front end and the back end it just works. It's trivial. This is you, you update your um, your project CLJS build stuff, and it just works. Um, uh, this is really useful for things like URLs, routes, um, uh, coordinating rendering uh, of, of, of pages on the front end and the back end. Um, for example, we pick some IDs um, and can actually just use uh, those IDs on in the HTML on the server and and in the client trivially. Uh, and it just, it all just works. And finally, like I was saying, we do have an auto-deploy thing. Um, uh, there isn't a REPL, and I, that is heartbreaking for me. Um, I, I usually have a CLJS REPL or a ClojureScript REPL up, but I can't actually uh, evaluate all of my code because the, the parse stuff just isn't available locally. Um, but the good news is that with this auto-deploy stuff, we can, uh, uh, make a change in the local code and have it in the production environment, not actually the production environment, but an, an environment that's identical to the production environment in about four seconds, uh, best case. I mean, if we're on a good internet connection and uh, uh, Clojure Script is behaving. So that's cool. Okay, so, so like I said, this has been sort of a, a rampage through uh, what we've been doing, um, but uh, it, it isn't a finished product by a long shot. Um, this is still very much something that, that we're using internally. Um, I have pulled a lot of this out into a library called Parsap CLJS, um, and there is obviously a template uh, that's publicly available that you can use to, to get going with this. But if you're interested in doing, in following what we're doing here, um, be prepared for bumps. Um, so like I said, there's no REPL, but this is neat. Uh, you can create a REPL endpoint that uh, can just take some closure script that it, it gets and it can evaluate it in the actual running parse environment and it can return the response. The problem is that if that thing that gets returned is an asynchronous thing, we have no way of waiting on that. Uh, the result that we get from eval is always a string. It's not actually a full-fledged channel, and so we just can't, we can't, uh, we can't do anything about it. That said, I think there there are uh, some some potential way, ways forward. We just need to investigate that a little bit more. And if we can get that working, um, because of the way the CLJS REPL is built with protocols, um, we can do basically just this. And we have a REPL on this parse environment um, that interacts with all of the tools that already exist in the ClojureScript environment. And this is something that JavaScript just doesn't, there's no, I mean, it's, it's like not even a starter. I guess you could get a ClojureScript, like a JavaScript REPL running on parse, but 
Um, it wouldn't interact with all the tooling in the same way. It wouldn't do all the nice things. We wouldn't be able to, if this works, and I, I really do think it's not that hard to get it working, um, we can just get it working with Emacs trivially, which is great. There are a few things we need. Uh, we need a new closure script release um, because some of the patches, uh, the, the last patch that we needed is actually in core now, but uh, it hasn't been released. Um, so we're waiting on that a little bit. Um, but like I said, it's still possible to develop with this stuff even before that. Um, we need to get the next tick patch to core.async merge so that we can start using just standard core.async again. Um, and we do need more flexible environment targeting. Chaz's um, uh, talk this morning about CLJX and feature expressions I think was, was really good and really interesting. Um, and one thing that I have really wanted is to be able to, to make changes to the closure script compiler that just target this one environment. And that's a tricky thing because there are a lot of different environments that might need lots of different things and it sort of turns into a, a, a difficult problem accommodating everybody. Um, but it would be awesome to have some sort of solution to that. Upstream from parse, we need source map support. Um, uh, this, is, this is like, this will change our lives because right now it's, it's still a fair amount of digging through generated JavaScript, which isn't super fun. It, it's not as bad as it sounds, but it's not great. Um, it would be great if they supported React on the back end. They, they're actually owned by Facebook, so it feels like a natural fit, um, but right now they, they don't. Um, if we could use React to render OM components server side and then use them front and client, I mean, it'd just be awesome. So uh, that'd be great. We also uh, need some support for actually getting core.async timeout working. They don't give us anything like get timeout, which actually sort of makes sense. If you're running sort of this managed server environment, you don't want to give people a way to say, hey, run this sometime in the future. Um, they could give us some sort of bounded get timeout, and that would be really nice, but it, it hasn't really been a priority for them. So um, we just need, if we get enough people using it like this, then I'm sure it will be. And then uh, in, in parseapp.clgs, which is uh, the, the uh, library that I've been extracting stuff to, um, we need to do a bunch of cleanup. We need to improve that web extract abstraction. It's, it's kind of awful. Um, we need to extract more common functionality that we've been using. Um, it'd be great to give sort of a standard way to unify server and client views, and um, <laughs> we need tests. Um, we actually have a way of testing the library itself, but uh, it's, it's pretty janky. It means pushing up to a live parse environment and running tests and stuff, and it's, and it's pretty bad. Um, there are also a bunch of infrastructure improvements, um, the REPL, like I said, and improvements to bin developed so that it, um, it is a little bit more robust. So the development experience of this stuff has been a long way from regular Clojure Web Development. I've done Clojure Web Development. It's awesome, uh, especially compared to this. Um, but it, it still beats JavaScript. I'm still insanely happy that I'm not writing that. Um, and you should come find out tomorrow. So I'll be hanging out at the hack thing tomorrow. I'd love if you're interested in doing this kind of thing, or even if you're interested in deploying to Node and have questions about how it might work or have gotten stuck, come find me. Um, happy to sit down and, and give you a hand. Um, and uh, that'd be fun. So that's pretty much it. I'm Travis. Um, uh, hit me up on Twitter if you're interested in this stuff. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>